I'd like to just like to invite you, if you would, to. Um, can you hear me back there? It's okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I'd like to invite you to just join me with a short word of prayer. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for being here with us this day. Also, we thank you for the joy of being able to share you, the joy of the young people that you've brought into our lives in this church. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide as we look at your scripture and take it within. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to thank Linda for inviting me to be able to speak. This is the most exciting and important of opportunities for me because it is young people that really I enjoy so very much. And I'm very proud of uh, our adventures and our pathfinders and our teens and very proud of the Santa Clarita Church in, and their leadership in providing good direction and uh, activities for these young people so their lives will become centered in, in the church. When I grew up, I, as I mentioned and some of you will remember, I grew up in the Pomona Church and uh, at that time the Pomona Church was very full. We had lots of things going on for young people. It seemed like uh, if it wasn't school, it was, uh, it was uh, roller skating on Saturday nights or volleyball on Sundays or trips here and there or bike rides to Phoenix, Arizona and all sorts of things that we did together. And when I look at my childhood, I, I can look back and I find that I cannot separate church life from my childhood. It was very much a part of our childhood. And so um, what is happening here really encourages my heart because we have a very precious gift here in this church. Did you know that? I'd like to ask all our adventurers and all those that fall into that age bracket to stand again for me. Stand up if you can, all of you. Okay, wonderful. Now, stay standing for just a moment. And do we, I see some even in the back. Do we have some younger, maybe even infant age? If so, parents don't drop them, but hold up a hand. <laughs> okay, I know I saw, yeah, there's one, there's another one. <laughs> Wonderful. And we have some teens too, don't we? If we have teens, stand up. If you're over, if you're 13 or over, how about standing up? Okay, I see some hesitating there. Okay, great, wonderful. These folks are God's sacred gift to us. Thank you for standing. Such a sacred gift. When, when we were expecting our first one, as I mentioned to some of you in the past, he came as a total surprise. We'd been married for seven years. We weren't sure if we were going to have children or not. And suddenly, he was there. And as he was growing in my sweet wife, um, we discussed names and we came up with a name that means gift of God. So he's Matthew. Um, his first name is Rex because that's a family thing. Dad's name was Rex. My, I've got cousins Rex. I've got Rex is all over the place. So he had to be Rex too. And uh, later in life, he decided he didn't want to be anyone's Matt anymore. He wanted to be Rex. <laughs> so he changed his name. But mom has a problem because he's still our gift from God, precious gift from God. You know, as I look around in our North American division today, um, when I first started in ministry, I felt a tremendous calling to work with young people. And God answered my wish and my joy, and I had the joy of spending 18 years working with young people, every one of them precious and wonderful. I just last uh, couple weeks ago went to San Diego, to San Diego Academy, invited to join the class of 85, because they all said, we want Pastor Park there. And what a joy it was to see those high schoolers that I taught Bible to have uh, some of them are probably heading towards having grandkids now. 
uh, but they all had kids that were in their teens and stuff like that, and what a joy it was to see and be with them. They were a precious gift to me. But most of the time that I was in youth ministries, I made myself quite obnoxious. I kept talking to leaders and people around me and saying, we are missing out at a tremendous opportunity. When I came from South Carolina in the early 70s, I came back to California because I remembered all the wonderful things the conference was able to do in youth ministries. I remembered that the youth department at the conference had five or six people in it most of the time, each one with a special designation to work with certain age groups and summer camp and pathfinders and ventures and teens and young adults and everything like that. And I was going to come back to California where it was all happening. But the reality is when I got back, I found that we've gone through some changes. We're downsizing now. And I kept saying to them, you need to put emphasis and put individuals into the local churches to work with young people. It does my heart good to see that in the Santa Clarita Church, there are members who step forward, and like Linda and others, and really put their heart into working with these young people for the Lord. They're our precious gift. And that's something special. But the, through the years, I kept saying to them, if you keep doing this, we're going to lose them. I still have a dream. I have a dream that every church should have an individual that's paid in Christian education. They should not only do fun and wonderful and neat and things with kids, but they should provide education about Jesus Christ and the Bible on a special basis weekly, like just like going to school. <laughs> I, and I have a dream that when kids graduate from their spiritual and religious training, they won't graduate from church because they're members of their church and they're already involved and have responsibilities in the church. And they'll say, this is my church, you know. I'm not going anywhere. I dream of things like that. And uh, church family, I invite you to dream also. Because if enough of us dream, we'll even become more powerful for our young people and the trust that God has given us. And those young people, believe me, will become the leaders of tomorrow. My, one of my success stories was when I was in the Arlington Church. I had um, a young man uh, who uh, became my right-hand man. He was so responsible and so good with his decisions and, um, and so bright. He just was there all the time doing stuff, helping plan with all the other people, helping plan and carrying them out. And, and then I had another young lady come from, from Bolivia with her sister, and she stayed, and, uh, and she was baptized there. They marry, and, um, and I visited them not long ago. He is, um, I think, at about three down from the top uh, tier of intel now. And I can see that kind of development. The leadership that he learned was actually in the youth department. It actually came working with the other kids, planning, developing, and stuff like that. I could tell you lots of stories of other young people that went on to be mighty for the Lord. I'm excited. Um, I had, just two weeks ago, I had a young man come and say, Pastor Park, there was something special that you did. I wanted to thank you for all those mission trips that we did get together. He is now the senior pastor of Benito Valley Church in San Diego. And, I've got, and I can look around and see that God blessed me to have the wonderful joy to be a part of these young people's lives during a time they were becoming acquainted with Jesus Christ and growing in him and to see how it go, goes. I think as I look back, I've had six or seven individuals that's either gone into youth ministries or pastoring and I had some little part in that, and I praise the Lord for that. But I wanted to share with the adventurers today a short story, and I'd like to share with the adults a story about that same individual, just briefly. Um, it's about Samuel. 
you all have heard of Samuel. Adventures, you probably remember the story about Samuel very well. Pathfinders, you remember about Samuel. You remember how um, his mother had wanted him very badly, but it never seemed to happen, and she prayed and prayed and prayed. God answered her prayers, and then Samuel was born, but not before she made a promise that this precious gift that God had given him would be dedicated to be used in the Lord's work. And so Samuel, once he began to grow up, my guess is probably around five or six, maybe seven years old, she talks about, I'm going to keep him until he's weaned. And I, um, I had neighbors in, in, uh, in, um, in uh, when I was at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, who were from the Middle East, and they were weaning their children still at five and six years old. So <laughs> I'm guessing that that's probably the age that he was at. And so it, um, he was taken to, Eli, with, to be with Eli and serve there. You remember the night that there came a voice to Samuel? It said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, I hear you, Lord. And he went running to Eli. He thought Eli was calling him. Woke Eli up. Why did you wake me up? Well, I heard you calling. I didn't call you, boy. <laughs> Go back to sleep. He goes back to sleep. Second time, Samuel, Samuel. He jumps up, runs to Eli. And Eli says, why are you waking me up again? And then he thought, you know, I think somebody's calling you other than me. And so he said, next time you hear somebody calling out to you, you just answer, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm listening, I'm here for you. And so Samuel went back and went to, his, went to bed, and it wasn't too long when he heard the voice again, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, yes, Lord, I'm listening. What would you like me to do? And... Um, and God then talked to him about what he was going to do for him all through the future and that he had his life all planned in a positive way for him. And Samuel did live that year. Now, there's something I'd like adventurers to learn about this and young pathfinders to learn about this. Sometimes voices will call out at home. <laughs> and sometimes those voices will say, can you pick up your toys? <laughs> Can you pick up your clothes? Can you clean up your room and things like that? Remember how Samuel responded. Yes, Lord, <laughs> I'm listening. And maybe most assuredly, your life will be filled with happiness and joy just like Samuel does, just like Samuel did. And God was with him to the very end, from the time he was a young boy to the very end. Now, parents, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Samuel also, but I'm going to go back a little bit further. I'm going to talk to you about his mom, Hannah. We don't, um, we don't often disassociate ourselves from stories in the Bible. We have a tendency to place these stories into our culture, into our experience, and, and we take them on to ourselves. Now, if we had Hannah's situation, what would we do, et cetera, et cetera. But it was much different then. Culture was different, and the pressures of the culture were totally different. Let me share with you briefly about Hannah. Hannah was a, an individual who, who married her husband she was obviously probably very attractive, personality-wise, as far and, and physically too. Her husband, we're told, just really, really loved her. But they were married year after year after year, and a happy marriage with joy and happiness in their life, and nothing came of it. <laughs> they didn't have children. And in that culture at that time, the 
the woman was very important to the family because she provided the children that would grow up and support that family and do the work and, and make everything happen. And so a wife that bore many children was a wonderful thing. And birth control was unheard of. <laughs> and so there was just lots and lots of kids. But one who had no kids, that was a catastrophe and a shame. And Hannah was, although she was probably very beautiful and a lovely personality, she had a self-worth that was probably about this high because she was the wife that hadn't made her husband proud. <laughs> she hadn't had children. Today, we've got lots and lots of different opportunities and things that we might do to make that happen, but not Hannah had only one. And that was to that family would come another wife. And that wife, hopefully, would bear children. And that's what happened in this family. A second wife came along. And that wife was very fruitful, had lots of children, and reminded Hannah that she had none all the time. And what a difficulty it was. And the husband would step in and say, what do we do here? And then he would say to Hannah, you know I love you. And he'd give her more than he gave the other one. Anything to, to make her self-worth feel better and to tell him that he really loved her. But nothing really did it. So we find in the Bible, Hannah's at the temple. The Eli looks over and sees her praying intently, but she's mouthing words. Today, we would think she's talking on the phone. A few years ago, we would have thought maybe she was schizophrenic. But in reality, in this setting, she was in such a relationship with God there in the temple, pouring out her heart of, of her need for a child so much that Eli mistook it. He said, you know, you shouldn't be drinking when you come here. <laughs> you shouldn't be drinking. She said, no, I, I'm not. And then she began to pour out her, her, um, her great uh, story of, of loss. And Eli just simply said to you, go, go out and be fruitful. So that cheered her up, and she left. And soon she found that she was expecting, which was unbelievable to her. She knew it was a miracle, and she had promised God that if he would give her a boy that, uh, or a child, just a child, that that child would be dedicated to the Lord's work and work in the temple too. And that's, that's how Samuel came to be in the temple. He was a great, great leader. Eli was a wonderful leader, but he wasn't so good with his kids. He let them run free reign, but Samuel shown as someone special, and he worked to the very end for the Lord. The one thing that I found in this whole story is that um, we could be Samuels. To the, I mean, we could be, we could be a positive Eli <laughs> to all the Samuels that run around the pews in this church and in the grounds, come to Sabbath school, go on wonderful trips, and things like that. We could be different than Eli. We could be a special Eli. We could be one that when kids, when a mother has a child that's a small, and it's hungry, and it starts crying, we could be the one that doesn't turn around and frown. We can be the one that's supportive, that says, can I help in any way? When a child a small child is running through the church, we could be the one that, that goes to them and says to them, I'm glad you're having fun in the Lord's heart house. Isn't it a wonderful place? Instead of scolding them and making them feel bad, we could be the one that that little heart remembers and makes a part of the whole part of church life and spirituality, one of golden memories that we never want to forget because we were that special one that God sent to do that thing. I believe God can really do that. And each one of us can make a tremendous change. You know, we're not just responsible for our own children. We're responsible for all the children. 
They're all our precious gifts. Church as a whole, if we don't have those children and they don't stay, we won't have the leaders of tomorrow. We won't have the voices calling out, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. So it's important to us to have that. And you can definitely make a difference. You can make a huge difference. Some of the people I remember the most from my childhood, and I was sharing it with Mrs. Thornquist last week, are the people of that Pomona church that were so special and so unique and made it possible for us kids to do so many neat things at that time and, and have the great Pathfinder Club that we had, have adventures and all the other things that we, we did at that time. They were special people and they're stuck in my mind even though they're resting in the Lord and long gone. They're special. You can be special too.